Welcome to the Pathways Research and Training Center's January 23rd webinar, Best Practices in Training Service Providers in Transition Competencies. My name is Lee Grover. I am the Project Manager for the Pathways Transition Training Partnership, and I'd like to begin with a few housekeeping announcements. Next slide, please. Please see the advice on this slide to make the most of your GoToMeeting webinar experience. In particular, please note that during the presentation, all audience members will be muted, but you can send your questions to us via the chat feature. We will also have a chance for the presenters to answer some questions at the end of the presentation. A recording of this webinar will be available along with a downloadable PDF of the presentation online shortly after the webinar ends and will be available from the link shown below. And we'd like to invite everyone who registered for this webinar to stay in touch with Pathways RTC by signing up for our monthly email newsletter, RTC Updates. We feature links to Pathways resources, like this webinar, as well as news and events of interest to the field. You'll receive an invitation via email after the webinar, and we hope you will accept it. Next slide, please. And with that, welcome to today's webinar, Best Practices in Training Service Providers in Transition Competencies. Today we have four panelists to introduce you to. First from the Pathways Transition Training Partnership team, Pauline Javanji and Eileen Brennan, Jamie Farish of Youth Era Oregon, formerly Youth Move, and Damie Jackson Dope, who is on the Youth Move National Board of Directors, both of whom are team leaders that participated in our study are joining us to share their experiences of facilitating team-based learning. We also plan on leaving 10 minutes at the end for Q&A. You, you can ask us questions using the chat feature. If they're easily answerable, we may reply during the webinar, and we'll otherwise wait to address them at the end of the webinar. If there are questions that we do not get to, uh, we will either follow up individually, or if needed, we can create an FAQ sheet and post it. Next slide, please. So um, here are the, uh, oh, there we go. Um, so the Pathways Transition tr uh, Partnership team, who will be speaking are Eileen Brennan, Pauline Javanji, and myself, Lee Grover. Next slide, please. So to go over the agenda, um, what we'll, we will be reviewing the Promoting Positive Pathways to Adulthood tr Online Training Modules and Training Toolkit and Evaluation, um, sharing of experiences and perspectives of team leader participants. There will be an overview of findings of Supporting You and Supporting Youth National Study, um, our National Study of Training Needs, a review of studies of effective training strategies, discussion of implications for future training, and then, um, as I said previously, a Q&A at the end, um, and it'll be about 10 minutes long. And here are the transition training personnel. All right, um, now I will get started with the summary of the training program, Promoting Positive Pathways to Adulthood, and I'll be referring to it as PPPA. So PPPA is a research-tested um, series of 10 free online training modules with an accompanying toolkit of um, team-based exercises to complement the learning process. Um, the training series is designed to build the capacities of direct service providers, including peer support providers and family support providers who are working with youth and young adults who have mental health difficulties and their families. Um, the goals of these, this training program is for service providers to gain increased awareness of the unique needs of youth and young adults in the transition years, as well as bolster their confidence and skills to engage with youth and young adults through focusing on strength, empowerment, building um, more positive outcomes through and working towards wellness and self-determination, as well as building skills for collaboration with families and across systems and agencies. Next slide, please. So here are the, um, 
the topics of the 10 hour long training modules. And each module is, um, like I said, approximately one hour in length. And the modules include key information on topics. There are video clips featuring young adults and service providers talking about their experiences. Um, interactive questions throughout the modules. And at the end of each module, there is a quiz leading to a certificate of completion or continuing education unit. Um, each module is accompanied by a reference and resource list, glossary, as well as the accompanying practice exercises in the toolkit. The modules are free, and there will be a link at the end of this webinar for where you can take them. Next slide, please. All right, so the Pathways Transition Training Toolkit um, really complements the modules. Uh, you can go through the exercises as you, as you work through the modules. Um, the toolkit really allows people to engage in team-based learning, or you can go through them individually and reflect on the exercises. Um, they help, they're helpful to apply skills in situations similar to those that providers encounter in their work, working with youth, young adults, and families. The activities can also be adapted to be more applicable to your organization um, in local context. The toolkit is free and it can be downloaded from the Pathways website. And there will also be a link at the end of this webinar for where you can access it. Next slide, please. So the Pathways Transition Training Partnership team uh, did conduct a evaluation research study on the training program. And it was a quasi-experimental study that compared learning outcomes of service providers. There were 19 organizations that were recruited for the study. And the teams of providers were randomly assigned to one of two groups, one group um, being those that just completed the online training modules. And the second group completed the online training modules plus organizational support being the toolkit practice activities. So the, um, the, two, the two forms of measurements that we looked at were knowledge outcomes and gains in participants' confidence in their transition service competencies, their self-efficacy and ability to provide services to transition age youth. The knowledge outcomes were measured using the module-specific 10-item multiple choice tests that are given at the end of each module in which you need to score 7 out of 10 to pass. And then the, um, the confidence piece, the self-efficacy to provide, to deliver transition services were obtained from the transition service provider competency scale. And this was given to participants at baseline before they started the modules, and then after completion of module five, and then completion of module 10. So we looked at those two tools to evaluate the effectiveness and differences between the two groups. And we looked at scores from participants who completed modules one through 10. And then module two also completed an assessment tool, a rating tool for the exercises and their helpfulness. Next slide, please. So the results found that in terms of the um, confidence or self-efficacy to deliver transition services, there, were no, there was no difference between the two groups. Both improved their confidence significantly. Um, so just the fact of going through the, the modules and also the modules and exercises both helped in increasing confidence to deliver services. Um, there, with the knowledge of transition services, both groups increased their knowledge scores as they went through the modules. However, with group two, they did have more significant, greater increases with their knowledge scores. And also within group two, the participants who completed more activities um, had higher knowledge scores, so the two could be related. Higher knowledge scores so this kind of says that higher knowledge scores of the group two participants may reflect their experience of practice exercises as being supportive for their learning process. Additionally, with group two, when they rated the activities, 
the activities that were rated as interesting and engaging and as cultu culturally relevant were more likely to be the activities considered helpful for application of modules to practice and for practicing needed skills. So overall, the results from this evaluation indicate that online training is effective in improving service providers' confidence of transition service competencies, and also practice-based exercises may be related to increased knowledge scores. Next slide, please. All right, and now I will introduce Jamie Farish. Jamie joined Youth Era, formerly Youth Move, in 2009. She has over 15 years of experience in national policy work in both mental health and addictions in the intellectual disability field. Her entire life has been dedicated to the betterment of youth who experience mental health and addiction challenges. She has been awarded the Children's Mental Health Award for Excellence from the State of Oregon and the Advocate of the Year from Oregon Council of Child and Adolescent Psychology. Hi. Um, so, I am Jamie, as she said. I want to go ahead and start off by um, just taking time to thank Pathways Center for the opportunity, both for um, our staff across the state to participate, but also to have a voice today at this training. Um, a little bit about my background um, to help you sort of um, think about some of what I've learned as I share and how that might apply um, for you and your organization and your role. Um, we are most known as Youth Move Oregon. Um, we recently changed our name to Youth Era. Um, so that's a little bit new, so in case you're getting a little confused with you, Sarah, wondering who that is, that's us. Um, we are a statewide, um, we began as a statewide organization, um, oftentimes what we would typically call a pure organization, meaning that the entire organization is made up of consumers that um, have lived experience in different systems, where our, um, everyone except for me and our accountants are um, young adults. So we've got uh, 49 employees, so that's very, very, very youth-driven. Um, and as we go about um, with organization and beginning to provide services and supports as this workforce began to develop, we've gone through uh, many changes over the past few years um, as workforce has developed, particularly related to the training and development, coaching, support, and sustainability of young adults in the workforce with lived experience who are reaching out and serving transition age youth and young adults which we define as ages 14 to 25 um, with our programming. Our programming across the state consists of drop-in centers, um, which are stigma-free uh, places where young people, regardless of insurance or whatever's going on in their life, can go and get supports. We also have wraparound youth partners throughout the state and additional peer support specialists that are embedded everywhere from ER to juvenile justice, um, mental health, community, all that. So that is a little bit about um, kind of our background. My hat, um, I'm uh, Chief Operating Officer, is one of my hats that I wear. Um, and with this project, I also took on um, the beginning of taking uh, the lead and then figuring out how, how is that going to look around the support of our people as they're working on the project across the state. They're located all over the state. We're not in one area. Uh, Oregon is also a very rural state. And so some of those organizational pieces um, came into play um, but it's also why this project worked really well because it was uh, online based and um, made it easy for people to access modules and learn uh, regardless of where they are. Um, <clears throat> so as one of the uh, leading peer youth organization, we're constantly challenged with workforce development for a large number of young adults, not only in Oregon, but we also do national um, technical assistance and training. So with that, we um, have worked with a lot of people that are also um, you know, trying to do what um, they need to do in order to build the workforce as well. And so we're pretty used to working um, in culturally responsive ways, and we understand there's differences between rural and urban and, and some of those factors. So I'll begin a little bit um, with a little bit of feedback around how things worked um, for us with, the, with our experience around team-based practice activities um, that we engaged in with this project. Um, my first note is really around time, um, and I think that in general we tend to um, underestimate the time really needed. Um, sometimes we think that an online thing is going to be faster, um, and but that's not the end of it. Uh, we really need to have kind of follow up. And so I, um, one of the things that we we realized pretty quickly on is that we had to really dedicate more time 
for our people to get through steps and participate um, and then have the support they needed afterwards. Also accountability, we needed to build some accountability in within our organization um, with the supervisors that were leading the teams through the modules locally. Um, so we had to set some internal dates around when expectations were that they would um, complete the different modules. They're busy, um, they certainly were excited, um, but when you're doing direct support, you've got referrals and there's these demands that are on you, um, we tend to push off our own learning. And so we had to really schedule that into calendars and have supervisors support the staff and ensure that they had the time that they needed. Um, the discussions, sessions are, were very helpful, um, both internally and with those in the project. Um, it's important both for management to talk with the supervisors that are managing um, direct line staff um, as you go along as well, and then practicing the concepts. So these modules were fantastic, but that it doesn't end there. We had um, we realized that you know we needed to in order to really deepen that learning and ensure that they were walking away with these skills, rather than just saying, okay, I took the module, I passed, and now I know that. Um, one thing we've learned around young adults is that, um, and I think people in general, it's it's really important to role play, to have scenarios, to practice. Um, these skills and not just learn them once and then just assume that they know them uh, moving forward. Um, some of the challenges that um, for us were around communication um, and follow through. Um, like I said, we had staff across the state and the accountability piece, which I already talked, talked about. Um, we approached the support of team members. Uh, what I did was I worked regionally with supervisors and then um, they had assigned groups of line staff that they managed regionally to ensure that everybody um, was getting their needs met, they had enough time um, to move through the project. Um, so whether, how did we determine whether the trainings we um, provided have made a difference? For, um, besides you know, the pathways portion with their evaluation, additionally what we usually do is we have observations. So, after um, our young adults have moved through training, we're, we're going to have managers and supervisors on site to, um, to, to observe and to kind of give immediate feedback and report back both to my level around how is everybody doing and do we need some additional training um, and to ensure that they really do have those skills. Because even if they seem to rock it in a scenario, sometimes getting in front of young people, um, they may run into a hiccup and be unsure how to, how to do that. All right, so now we get to some of the advice um, piece in general, and I'm going to sort of talk about um, my experience around young adults in the workplace, specific to, to this and what we've learned through the years. Um, what the important part to remember is that young adults are young adults. Um, and so one of the really light bulb moments for me doing this work, I came from the family field and um, used to run a family organization, and this is one of the things that is a little bit different that I realized when we began training young people early on, was that um, based on their experiences, their lived experience, how they grew up, their culture, and all these different things, that when you translate some of the expectations and some of these training pieces, it looks very different based on their lived experience and how they grew up. A simple explanation of what I mean by this is that in our drop-in centers, we have a cleaning list. Um, at the end of the day, so pretty simple. Um, and we had trouble with the cleaning list being um, done properly. So you think to yourself, you know, what's going on? You know, it's really to wipe down the table, things like that. What I realized, which was a huge shift for me in doing this work, was that for the young adults that we employed working in there, based on their lived experience, when they looked around that drop-in center, it was sparkling clean to them. When I looked at it, I could see the things that were out of place or weren't done either properly or weren't done at all. So that pop can or that piece of garbage in the, you know, on the floor in the corner, they literally didn't see it. And so that was really a place for me to sit back and say, we need to reapproach this um, and take a look at how do we train and support our people in a different way. With our services and support that the underpinning of all of our programs is the 40 developmental assets out of the Search Institute. Um, easy way to translate that is there's a the set of internal and external assets or skills that research has shown that the more of them they have, the more successful they'll be in life. And what we realized is that the people that we hired didn't have all their assets and skills developed either. 
and they were hired and then supporting and teaching and training the young people in transition for the same thing that they may or may not have under their belt yet. So we really had to kind of step back and take a look at that piece. We also had to ensure that um, we were culturally responsive, um, not only with the many wonderful cultures that we have in general, but with youth culture as itself. Youth culture is a culture. And so utilization of technology, understanding how they're, they're changing brains, um, are, are working, their ability to um, you know, be on social media, well, <clears throat> also you know, completing a quiz. I mean, there's just a lot of things that are different now um, than a lot of us have experienced growing up that are older. Um, and then the caveat to that is to remember that not all youth are tech-driven. So there still is um, a portion of that as well to keep in place. Um, one advice when you think about it, beginning to employ is to remember that you need to preparation. So you need to take a look at your policies, your procedures within your organization before bringing on young adults into the workplace and also with peer services as well. Um, if you don't have to change policies and procedures, um, you might want to look a little harder at that. Generally, there are some of them that have to change. You want to take the time to prepare stakeholders, management, coworkers on bringing these young people in. Um, you want to take an inventory on their skill sets and assets that staff have. Um, you, uh, that's really important so that you know if they need some accommodations with training materials, um, both with learning. You know, some of them learning online may not um, be as easy for them based on a learning disability, for example. And so you need to shore up whatever it is they need and provide accommodations for that. You need to think about their lived experience and how that may have affected their development of their own skills and then provide opportunities for them to build the skills, which is the same thing we do with the youth we serve. Um, also want to observe their application of skills and learning. Practice it, reteach it, provide real-time feedback on the spot with them. Don't wait a week to give them feedback about an interaction they had with a young person where maybe they forgot a skill or a, a piece of the training. Give it to them right away. Um, Hands-on, videos are great, practice scenarios are fantastic, um, provide groups for them, and just keep that um, observation and feedback loop open. Provide application of skills and learning, um, that's continuous. Then regularly revisit all your concepts and skills so that you can ensure implementation to fidelity and um, continued growth of those young adults that you're employing or working with. And at the end of the day, I have a thing called it's business is business, meaning that some of the young people that we employ, like any staff member and employee we employ, may not be ready for this role yet. Um, and that's not what this is about, but that's something that we need to think about, um, that at the end of the day, the mission of serving young people has got to trump. So sometimes I know we can run into um, some challenges with that. I'm happy to answer some more questions with that after. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Now I will introduce uh, next slide, please. Now I will introduce Damie Jackson Dope. Damie has previously served as the chair of the North Carolina Community of Practice for Youth and Young Adults in Transition, and she is currently on the Youth Move National Board of Directors and Best Practices Subcommittee, chair of the North Carolina Mental Health Block Grant Planning Council, a national advisor on equity and inclusion for the STAR Center, and creative director of her own consulting agency called Integrated Approaches. Hi, everyone, and welcome. I also want to thank Pathway Center for this opportunity to share my experience of facilitating team-based learning. When the invitation for the Promoting Positive Pathways National Study was released, I was the co-chair of the Community of Practice on Youth and Emerging Young Adults in Transition, which is a subcommittee of the statewide North Carolina Collaborative for Children, Youth, and Families. The collaborative itself provides a forum for collaboration, advocacy, and action among families and community partners to improve outcomes for all children, youth, and families through system of care frameworks. The opportunity to participate in the team-based evaluation process came at the best time because we were in the early stages of organizing the community of practice. The community of practice consists of a diverse representation of state and local agencies, youth families and advocates, including child welfare, public safety, employment, housing, and transportation. The online training modules was a way for us to organize ourselves in a way that honored the, the wealth of knowledge that each individual brought to the group and explore points of shared practice, language, and overall context for supporting youth in transition. And one of those ex examples I'd like to share is um, we, 
as a group when we completed the first module, which is entitled Partnering with Youth and Young Adults. That uh, module included a glossary of terms, including definitions of positive youth development, and it included emp empowerment approaches. And as a group, this helped us to find points of convergence and at the same time document ways in which there was divergence in opportunities for problem solving. One of the members, uh, for example, who was responsible for state Medicaid trans uh, transportation mentioned how helpful it was just to be uh, going through the module and learning about the unique needs of youth in transition. And it would allow for her to provide and think through application as it relates to transportation. Um, the, that example also, um, also allowed me to think through also of highlights and benefits of the team-based approach in that it improved learning in general and action that helped to strengthen the collective systems that we know potentially support youth in transition and those with complex behavioral health needs. Um, so in other, wise, in other words, the um, team-based approach support across systems discussion and really helped with promoting recovery, cultural awareness, and discussing all those topics, including planning partnerships and bridging service gaps. I would um, also like to share that it was great that each member of the community of practice was excited early on in participating in the evaluation and throughout the process and found that the topics and online format was very helpful since we all lived in different parts of the state. So it made it really challenging for us to meet in person, but the format was very helpful, to, uh, not only an engagement, but overall participation. Um, the experience of the participants were positive, as I mentioned, and one member actually said that she liked how the modules, each one of them built on each other. And she said, I like the interactive activities within the modules, and I felt that the videos within the modules built on one another. So as a, as a lead, I also wanted to reflect on our participation and provide some tips that was helpful in terms of the overall planning process. So as the team lead, I, like um, Jamie mentioned, I underestimated the amount of time needed for members to connect with one another and to discuss the content and to engage the cross-system knowledge translation that needed to happen on each of the topics. Uh, one member specifically said that it would have helped her more had she had more opportunities for peer interaction. So if you're considering facilitating training in cross-system environments, you would definitely need and want to come up with some strategies to sync schedules and to come up with a structure for flexibility, a flexible format, but still um, structured enough for peer interaction. We did have two phone conferences that lasted about an hour, an hour and a half. And throughout the process, um, it was helpful to discuss um, these topics with one another, but we definitely needed more time together. In fact, um, my co-chair and I um, had decided to come up with um, an opportunity to meet in person. We kind of called it a lunch and learn for everyone to complete whichever module they were on, um, but we had to cancel that due to, uh, primarily it was due to schedules. So even though the modules were self-paced and provided a dev, um, self-paced and allowed everybody to work at their at their own pace, it still would have been helpful too as a tip to encourage a deadline. Um, this way you can create also a space for accountability and structure for those that appreciate having boundaries and also at the same time having expectations for completing the modules um, so that each member can be prepared to interact um, in phone or in, by person. Uh, although the online format made sense for us, it would have been helpful also if I used more time in the planning stage to take inventory on diverse learning styles of the group. Um, this also would have helped to facilitate if there was, um, if anyone needed any access issues or um, challenges of accessing the modules and needed reasonable accommodations. Uh, for example, one, um, one person struggled with um, dyslexia and it would have benefited in advance to make sure he had software to um, access the text or do voice to text so that he was even more engaged as well. Uh, and then there was also a, a member that lived more in a rural community and it was a challenge accessing the trainings at home. Um, their internet was basically unreliable, uh, but those are things that uh, um, maybe at the beginning, I uh, more time uh, could have processed out and, and we could have problem solved together. Uh, the other tip I would recommend is providing materials much further in advance to orient members to the information and to communicate the significance of their involvement in a team-based learning format. 
And the other tip also included, uh, which I felt like was really also critical was getting the commitment from supervisors to allow um, <clears throat> members to be able to call in to the collaborative, the learning collaboratives. And one member actually said that uh, they felt that the material was worthwhile for training purposes, but was not sure how many agencies would really commit to it because of the amount of time, um, but could, thought was very, very useful uh, as a way to orient new staff. And the other piece on um, communicating and getting the commitment of supervisors, team leads me have to actually take another step and do some translation for each system to talk about why staff should participate in um, their uh, in the modules, especially if, uh, for example, transportation, they're not usually someone that's in the room on something like this. So we may have to do a translation across systems so they get the meaning of that. Um, and the last couple tips I have is, um, of course, more time commitment uh, was needed by myself as the lead facilitator to really monitor the progress, but it was very, very helpful having the support of the uh, training of trainer leads at Pathways because it really helped me to keep on pace and doing something that I wasn't quite used to as far as an online team-based approach, but having the support of Pathways, they kind of really helped me and coached me along the way uh, where I wasn't sure about some things. They helped to um, bridge the gap and let me know how my team was doing and how, um, we at least, how much um, participation we had um, with the modules. So I hope those tips were helpful. Thank you very much both um, to Damie and Jamie for giving on the ground information about what it was like to promote uh, online training through team-based exercises. Um, my name is Eileen Brennan and I am part of the Pathways Transition Training Partnership. And next I'd like to talk with you briefly about a national survey that we undertook with Youth Move National Best Practices Committee. Uh, we worked on this survey during 2017, and um, the, the committee worked with us to draft scales and open-ended questions. What we were really interested in was targeting key competencies and key skills that people might need training in, and then finding out what they would say was their level of priority for those particular competencies and skills. Uh, we went ahead and distributed the survey online from June 23rd to July 24th last year. And um, we then worked with the Best Practices Committee to interpret the results we got and to disseminate them to our partners. So the way people were invited to participate in the survey was to be contacted by either the collaborating groups, Pathways or Youth Move National, um, or other partner organizations. We publicized the survey and then we um, send out the link. And I'm hoping that some of the people that are participating in this call today took uh, part in the survey. So you will find out what other people said. Our goals in the survey were four. First of all, to discover what are the training needs and preferences of transition service providers who serve young people with mental health difficulties? We also wanted to see what were their preferred training modalities? What were uh, modalities that they most liked to use to learn about the services that they were providing? Um, we also were interested in exploring the barriers that they faced in trying to participate in trainings and we were going to use those uh, goals to get to a final goal, which is to, divide, uh, to guide development of training resources to improve transition supports to young adults with mental health needs in the transition years. So we're working on new forms of training, and we wanted to see exactly where we should target those. So if we can go on to the next slide, we'll talk about the participants. So um, the... The survey itself was called Supporting You and Supporting Youth. Thanks very much to the Best Practices Committee for giving us that wonderful title. A total of 254 service providers working with young people in the transition years, 14 through 29, completed the survey. 
Um, this national sample came from 39 states and the District of Columbia. And we've done a little bit of regional analysis and all four of the major regions of the U.S. participated uh, very well. So it's really a balanced view of um, training needs, we believe. Most participants provided mental health services, family support services, transition planning services, and or youth advocacy services. Many people endorsed more than one type of service they provided. On average, participants had worked with transition age young people for 12.7 for years, and they had been in their current position for five years. So most participants worked in a mental health organization. They held at least one college degree. Most identified as female and indicated they were non-Hispanic white. The median age of our responders was between 40 and 49 years. So um, it was a pretty experienced group that had really had quite a lot of education um, to begin with. So that uh, was something that surprised us in terms of the participants in the survey. So with, on the next slide, uh, I'd like to share with you something about the competency training needs that evolved. So when we um, looked at competency training, we really focused on nine areas that had emerged from the literature and our discussions with Youth Move. And um, there were four that stood out about half of the people taking the survey said that they needed or very much needed training for themselves, their own personal um, growth and development in these four areas. Employing trauma-informed principles to guide work, engaging youth by understanding youth culture, promoting natural supports, and using culturally responsive practices. So those were endorsed by a lot of people. And then more than two-thirds reported at least a moderate level of training need for the other five competencies, applying positive youth development principles, helping young people navigate transitions, supporting youth empowerment, collaborating with peer support providers, and using technology to communicate with youth. And um, the final uh, type of competency was something that's come up and a good number of discussions. And considering that the median age here in this group was 40 through 49, um, there was a tendency for people that had been around service provision longer and being older, having less comfort with um, the use of technology. So let's also look at skills. Um, as well as uh, the competencies, we also examined eight skills. Um, and over 40% reported that they needed, uh, or very much needed, skills training in accessing resources for youth, advocating for program improvements, increasing youth-driven practices in their organizations, supporting young adult peer support providers, and employing ethical principles to guide the use of technology for communication. About 60% indicated a moderate or greater level of need for training in responding to workplace stress by uh, applying self-care principles, clarifying their role in interdisciplinary teams, and using supervision to support their work. So let's quickly look at the next slide to look at training modality preferences. Um, most preferred were face-to-face -face workshops, training led by young adults, conferences, guidance from a specific cultural group, and on-the-job coaching. Somewhat preferred were the, the technology-based trainings like videos, learning communities, webinars, and self-paced online training. Least preferred were podcasts. So there were some barriers to training. Um, if, let's take a look at those in the next slide. Uh, participants uh, identified expenses, heavy workload, shortage of funds for travel, the distance to training, and limited time off as keeping them from getting the training that they needed. A few also uh, said that lack of organizational supports and in inadequate access to technology uh, kept them back 
held them back from getting training. Um, the least endorsed were the lack of supervisor support um, uh, ratings. Um, they largely felt the support of their supervisors in getting more training. We're very grateful to those service providers who took the survey and let us know about their needs and preferences. I'll next hand it over to Pauline Givangi, who's going to talk about what the training literature has told us. Thank you, Eileen. Um, at this point, we want to transition into a summary of what we've learned about effective training strategies, both from our own work as well as from reviewing other studies. Best practices in training for work with transition age youth are based on principles of adult learning and designed to maximize the application of new learning in the work setting. According to theories of adult learning, adults learn best when they're self-directed and highly motivated to learn, can devote time and energy to learning, and are actively engaged in examining their own attitudes and increasing their own knowledge and skills. Ideally, training content builds upon what individual participants already know, is presented in meaningful ways, and with potential to apply learning in ongoing work with support and feedback provided when participants implement new techniques. Effective training builds on past experiences and takes account of stages of individuals' professional development from novice to expert and taking account of learning style and learning modality preferences, whether auditory, visual, sensory, or practical. In addition to knowledge to effectively support youth, providers need to have positive attitudes to young people and practical skills that can only be gained on the job. Opportunities are needed for learners to examine new concepts and integrate them into existing frameworks, apply them in practice and reflect on their practice and how it impacts to use they're working with in order to have their attitudes and skills evolve. For service providers to be able to provide evidence-based, developmentally appropriate and culturally responsive support to young people, effective training initiatives need to prepare them to work, to work with the types of service users and in the types of community settings that they're likely to encounter in practice. To be responsive to young people's needs, advocacy organizations such as Youth Move National and the Federation of Families for Children's Mental Health have advocated for service users to be involved in the development and implementation of training initiatives. Service providers are increasingly asking for young adults with service experiences to provide training as we discovered in our training survey that Eileen just described. Talk a little about training modalities. Face-to-face -face training has the advantage of being tailored to local conditions, and according to our training needs survey, face-to-face -face workshops and conferences are popular with service providers. However, there's little evidence that such training leads to knowledge transfer, and face-to-face -face trainings are expensive to provide and limited in the numbers of people who can participate. Online training is growing in pop popularity as a cost-effective, accessible, and convenient approach, and there is some evidence of positive outcomes, but concerns have been expressed about accountability for follow-through on completion of self-paced training activities. So we need to think about ways to build in accountability for following through. Some studies suggest that there are added benefits from multi-component training programs, including improved service outcomes. For example, McKay and Associates reported increased service provider knowledge and skills and improved client well-being for service providers who were participants in a study of online training that included additional elements such as treatment manuals, workshops, consultation, taped review of practice sessions, supervisor training, booster sessions, and completion of case reviews. Next slide, please. For knowledge transfer to occur, on-the-job coaching and effective supervision, next slide, please. For knowledge transfer to occur, on-the-job coaching and effective supervision are needed to address the challenges in applying new learning and practice. High-quality coaching includes opportunities to observe and practice new skills, and receive detailed feedback. Additionally, knowledge transfer occurs in a supportive context 
where training goals and content are consistent with organizational goals, with supervisory support and reinforcement of new skills, and with appropriate changes in accountability and reporting structures. Demonstrated management support is needed to assure that staff have the time and resources to implement new practices with ongoing coaching to deal with challenges and to give and receive feedback. Next slide, please. For learning on the job and translation of new learning into improved practice with youth, staff need to believe that the organization will support them in applying new learning in their work and feel empowered to do their work and comfortable seeking consultation and support from supervisors, team leaders, and colleagues. Therefore, team leaders need to promote acceptance, respect, and trust, and create opportunities for coaching and learning. They need to identify participants' learning needs goals and facilitate constructive feedback, as well as to promote reflection and group interaction so that participants can learn from each other, are able to integrate their new learning with prior experiences, and thereby increase their effectiveness in working with youth and families. At this point, we have a few minutes left, and we want to um, provide an opportunity to hear your questions. And then um, after the Q&A, we'll take a couple of minutes to share some resources with you. Do we have any questions at this time? We have a question. What is the best training for working with different cultural groups? Um, I'll, we've got lots of ideas. I'll just say, first of all, that we do have th three of the modules in our series of 10 um, are focused on working cross-culturally. And we include in those, those modules videos of cultural experts and youth of various cultural diversities who are speaking about their experience receiving services. Um, I'd like to give opportunities for Jamie and Amy to address that question too, if you have any thoughts based on your experiences. Do you want to go first, Amy, or? No, go ahead. Okay. Um, I mean, I'm, I, I'm not thinking of like a specific, other than what was included in the modules, um, I, I think the takeaway here sort of is that there really isn't one training, um, even if you were to pull together training around youth culture specifically, um, just about youth culture and, and what that looks like, or urban and rural, um, you know, that's going to look different in, in different areas of the state um, in general. So I, I'm not, I don't have like a particular one to recommend. What I would say is I think it's important that you have representation from um, many different cultural backgrounds and opportunities from them to learn from the people from those backgrounds. So when we approach youth training around youth culture, we usually do that with an adult ally and young adults leading the training um, for a reason because that's culturally responsive, having them train you about that. Thank you, Jamie. Jamie? You want to add anything? Yeah, I just, I think that it, it seems like there's an, some missed opportunities in terms of um, engaging uh, diverse populations in even curriculum development and design and helping to inform um, and have uh, opportunities for developing actual training. So overall, it is a challenge trying to find um, sometimes even just developmentally appropriate uh, for young adult groups uh, and for certain populations. But I would certainly reach out to the Office for Minority Health. They probably have the best uh, information in terms of compendium um, of information uh, for um, trainings. But I also would reach out to, and I forget names, but she's our class. She's the uh, class lead for SAMHSA, uh, the Cultural Linguistics um, um, standards um, um, lead TA, but SAMHSA TA on, on cultural linguistic, linguistics, I'm sure they probably have some type of comprehensive list of uh, uh, trainings that's available on the topic. 
Thank you, Demi. Um, Eileen and Lee, anything else that you want to add before we go on to the next question? So we have a question about um, someone as asking about how to get help with preparing to provide services to homeless youth. That is not a topic we d discussed in depth in our training modules. In module eight, we did um, interview Don Schweitzer, who uh, has worked extensively in providing services to homeless youth. And he has some really interesting advice for all of us. Um, and that was certainly something that came up a lot in our training survey and something we're planning to work on. I think Jamie had some ideas. Oh, I was just going to add in. Um, when we look at that population, and, and I would say this is, um, you know, we um, also worked with uh, Dr. Don Schweitzer as well. But when we, um, working with homeless youth really is a part of all our programs, no matter where people are in the state. And the first thing um, I would say is that everything starts with youth engagement. So you've got to become a master engager. Um, and when working with homeless and runaway youth, um, a particularly powerful way of sort of taking a look at that is really hiring young adults that have been homeless, um, that have that lived experience. Um, so they um, are going to both have ideas that are culturally specific to the area um, and their um, and to youth in particular around how to engage them um, differently and how to approach that. Uh, taking the time to understand the culture, there's a street youth culture and there's um, also homeless and those are two different things. Um, so it's really beginning to understand and getting in there and talking with youth and young adults um, that have experienced it or are currently underhoused and seeing what are the unmet needs and, um, and going there. But generally working, making a big difference um, with the homeless and runaway youth really is a community effort um, wide, but don't forget to utilize young adults in that effort. Um, this is Eileen Brennan, and um, I wanted to point out a resource for our audience, and that is that we have had a webinar recently. If you go on Pathways um, website, you can find the webinar that was called Mental Health Needs and Service Use Among Young Adults Experiencing Homelessness, and that was presented by um, Sarah Narendorf of the University of Houston, who is engaging in a multi City uh, study of homeless youth, and Matthew Oretsky, um, a uh, social work faculty member here at Portland State who had years of experience working with homeless youth in the educational setting. So I'd, I'd strongly urge you to think about looking that uh, webinar up if you need some more assistance with training around homeless youth. Um, let's see. We have another question. Um, how can we train our staff to handle the ethics issues around the use of technology when working with transition age youth? Um, one resource I've come across recently is the, uh, the National Association of Social Workers, NASW.org is the website. They have uh, updated their code of ethics. And there are some sections in that code of ethics now that address the ethical aspects of using technology. Um, we've also heard of some organizations that are incorporating uh, principles of ethical use of technology in their staff training activities. And we, um, if the person who sent that question will send us an email, we could follow up with you to share. Uh, some contacts for that. Uh, there was a question about accessing the resources from this uh, webinar, and they will be posted, I think, later today. I don't know how long it takes to get the technology piece taken care of, but they will be there later today. Uh, I think that as we can advance the slides, there is a slide that shows the place where the technology or where the, uh, the presentation and resources will be posted. So if we can go on to the next slides, please. There's some references that might be useful if you want to do some further reading. And there, um, there's a link to the online training modules. If you go on to that first link, you'll see the 10 modules are listed out. You can click on each one 
to access the, the online module and you'll see that there are the other resources there also. Some of the modules also have transcripts. Uh, we've not been able to complete all of the transcripts yet, but we're still working on those. But you'll see glossaries, uh, practice exercises, uh, what else is there? Uh, reference lists. And then the toolkit is also available for download. And you can see in the toolkit that the, it's divided up with exercises linked specifically to the content of each module. There are three or four exercises linked with the content for each module. And go on, please, next slide. Next slide, please. There. We acknowledge our funders. And there is the, um, the, the uh, Pathways RTC website and our uh, resources there. We have another question. Has our research indicated how to best identify at the interview staff who are most interested in learning? Wow. Something I had not thought of before. Um, well, I, I would say, yeah, I mean, I think I have to think about it. I, I, I do think that's going to look a little bit different if you're, say, you know, hiring, um, you know, an older person versus a young person. Um, so I think how you approach that um, in an interview and pull that out of some questions, um, it's probably going to be a little different. Like how I would word that or be looking at that with when I was hiring family members to do work versus youth um, looks differently because young people, um, yeah, they just relate differently. Um, I, I'd be happy to share um, some of our interview questions um, around that. And then, you know, there's not a specific one. I'd say they're more sort of integrated in an overall sense of do they see themselves as a lifelong learner? Um, are they embracing opportunities to know more um, despite how knowledgeable they may come off in an interview? Are they still um, questioning and, you know, have a, a sense of, of wanting to learn more and, and those things? But like I said, I, I do that differently with young people versus um, older. Thank you. Yeah, my thoughts are... My thoughts are similar on that and that um, keeping in mind that during the interview process, uh, if you are interviewing an individual, um, in most cases, a lot of times we're interviewing people that have had not so good experiences around learning and how learning takes place. Um, so I'm thinking during the interview process, a real great trauma informed way of approaching it is even during the interview, um, interview in such a way that is very trauma-informed by incorporating different ways you're asking questions, not interview style, but more in a learning, uh, shared learning process. Um, and that would probably make someone feel very, very comfortable and see how responsive they are to the way in which um, uh, learning uh, and co-learning happens. So the, I think the interview um, experience is a really great way of seeing how responsive someone would be to a, a trauma-informed learning environment. Thank you, Jamie and Jamie, for both of those suggestions. And that's all the time we have for today. Um, if there are any unanswered questions, we'll follow up with email. I want to thank our presenters, Eileen Brennan and Lee Grover of the Pathways Transition Training Partnership Team, Jamie Farish of Youth Move Youth Era Oregon, and Jamie Jackson Dobbs of North Carolina Mental Health Planning Council for the time and effort you've put into preparing this presentation. As a reminder, our webinar slides will be published online shortly along with our collection of past webinars. Thank you for participating. Uh, can we have the funder slide, please? This webinar was made possible through funding from SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, and NIDLER, the National Institute on Disability, 